Hello, everyone. Welcome back to You Thought You Knew, the show where we talk about survivor players that may be underrated, underappreciated, or just misunderstood. Each week, we try to answer a question that's designed to make us challenge our preconceived notions about a famous survivor contestant. Of course, there are no right answers. It's just an excuse to talk about our favorite show. As always, I'm your co-host, Nigel Bocanegra, and I'm joined by the Kevin McLean. Yes, uh, excited to be here to talk about Eric and one of the most iconic moves in Survivor history. So it'll be a fun, fun episode. Yes, and a quick programming note. Uh, last time we had mentioned that we'd be speaking uh, on Aussie today, but we've had a slight schedule change. So today, as Kevin said, we are talking about Eric Reichenbach, and we are joined by the one, the only, the podfather, Rob Sesternino. They're going to say the dumbest survivor contestant <laughs> ever. <laughs> Rob says, the, the, you know, I've always said I'd rather be the dumbest survivor contestant to win than the smartest player not to win. Um, but here I am and uh, excited to chat about a icon, Eric Reichenbach. Yeah, I, to be so Reichenbach here on You Thought You Knew. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Kevin, do you want to get us kicked off uh, by going through your introduction for Eric? Sure. All right. Dramatic uh, uh, introduction for Eric. Like clockwork, Eric's foolish move is played on CBS commercials every few months. But he isn't the only player to ever give up immunity. Why was Eric dubbed the dumbest survivor of all time? And how did this characterization of him push Micronesia to be one of the most beloved seasons of all time? At a time when superfans did not need to be strategic game bots, did Eric's arc convince producers to like half newbie seasons as a model for the future? And this naivete seems particularly lacking in modern Survivor discourse too. Eric played on two of these seasons, Micronesia and Karamoan, and despite making the penultimate episode both times and on his return, Eric is almost entirely remembered for his one Micronesian moment. You thought you knew Eric Reichenbach? Well, we think we do. And on this episode, we'll be answering the question, is Eric the dumbest survivor of all time? Now, Rob, let's start with something uh, maybe a little basic. What do you think makes someone a dumb survivor player? I think somebody's a dumb survivor player when um, they are, I guess, uh, now again, we're coming to this. Uh, I was going to say, like, um, <laughs> they don't seem to really understand the game or what uh, the long term ramifications of the moves they're making uh, is. I was going to say, like, uh, are very gullible, um, but. I just think that as somebody who just doesn't understand, you know, what they're doing or how they're being perceived, I think that that's probably the uh, definition of a player that I would consider to be a dumb player. And Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it has to be someone that is e easily tricked, perhaps. I think Survivor so, is so associated with, like, strategy and plotting and, and, and thinking about the game. So the dumbest has to be someone who's not particularly good at any of those things um i think within regards to eric it's i mean can can a dumb player be someone that makes it so far in survivor or does a dumb player have to be a first boot i mean i think there's so many different ways to oh. approach that i think a dumb player can definitely make it far i think that sometimes the, some of the dumbest <laughs> players make it very far because the smarter players want to bring them along because they say okay this person will do whatever I tell them to do. And that is why they get so far in the game because that other players like sort of like use them as pawns. Mm, mm. But wouldn't a dumb, the dumbest player though, still screw that up though. <laughs> like, like someone that should just be able to coast out of there, out of there of them being a tool to others, but somehow they are so bad that they can't even get there. Hmm. Maybe you know, something to consider. You know, so I, I think that there's kind of two different ways to think about it. You know, Survivor is littered with people who are just not very familiar with the game, don't really understand uh, beyond like the basic mechanics of you vote people out. You know, I'm sure you could consider a bunch of them dumb Survivor players. But there are some very high profile moments that we have identified as really dumb moves, right? And I think for me... Those people are are the players that have 
demonstrated an ability to play the game and a decent understanding, but yet still make decisions or choices that they should probably know better than be doing. Um, someone that that comes to mind is uh, Wu from Kageon. He yeah. takes Tony, but you know, Wu is a big fan of Survivor. He makes it to the final two and he makes the wrong choice at the last second. And I think that Wu should have known to not take Tony. And I think that there were times in that final round that he believed he should not take Tony and yet he still did. So I, I think that some of those types of situations kind of stick out to me as some of the the dumber moves if you will yeah i think in the case of Wu, um you know he just i i you said that he is somebody who's a big fan of survivor i don't know if that's necessarily the case i think he definitely did rely on tony and like what tony was telling him and i think that tony got in his head Again, and like I, I don't want to necessarily throw the D word around in terms of what he was, uh, the decisions he was making. But I do think that he probably made some naive decisions uh, in terms of like who he was listening to and leaned a little too much on Tony for advice. Yeah, and I, and also just to say this as well, I mentioned that like was Wu a, a like a super fan in a sense, it's like, I feel like I recall vividly him not remembering what happens if there's a tie at the final four. And that feels like, uh, uh, that feels like a dumber moment than even the decision to take Tony. Like the, like, do we fight for it? Like that feels easier to almost like peg him to that. Cause it's like a, a misread if anything, uh, in the move category. Sure. And I think I would revise my statement to you. I, I think that Wu liked survivor and had watched it before and would call himself a fan because he had seen it and enjoyed it. He is not uh, an Eric level fan coming into the show. Certainly. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob, are there any other dumb moves that stand out to you over the course of survivor history? Well, you know, when we did the evolution strategy, I think I defined sort of like, and I think I've said that I thought that Wu uh, made the worst move because I feel like that it really is one of the few decisions where you say, okay, go in one door, you win the game, go in the other door, you lose the game. Uh, and Wu is the person who, you know, does make that move in Survivor Kagiyan. I think Colby is another person that you can point to. And I think that Colby's playing a different game in Survivor of the Australian Outback where I think he's playing the game of, hey, I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be a star. And I uh, could, yes, I could win the game if I take Keith and vote out Tina, but I'm not willing to do that. Um, and so I think that's like another version of that for Wu. I don't think it's necessarily like, and Wu ironically has gone on to have like an amazing career. Um, and I don't think that that was necessarily part of his calculus of I'm going to, you know, take Tony to the end because I want to be perceived in a different way. I think it's really interesting that you describe Colby's decision making in that way. Would you say that you think it's a bit similar to Cody Calafiore in uh, BB-16? Yeah, and the Cody one is is uh, really hard uh, because then he comes back and wins uh, in a different <laughs> season. Uh, and I do think part of it is because the people thought of him as like a loyal guy who, you know, stuck by his friends. But, you know, he did make, um, you know, a similarly, you know, very bad decision in BB-16. Yeah, and he, he goes on to succeed so much later that I think... Uh, it's like, was it dumb or was he just kind of like postponing it? <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm just going to ride the wave longer. He deferred it for just give me a couple of seasons. I will collect my winnings at that time. Yeah. So is, is he smart or are we the dumb ones for watching that entire season later? You know, like, I, mm -hmm. I think that's a different question. Uh, so, you know, let's uh, let's try to plant a flag here quickly. Kevin, do you think that Eric Reichenbach is the dumbest survivor of all time? Um, I, I don't think Eric is the dumbest survivor of all time. And I'm sure we'll expand on that later, but I'm, I'm going to say it right now and take the controversial position. I don't think Eric is the dumbest survivor of all time. I don't know if I can name the dumbest survivor of all time, but I don't think it's Eric. I will agree. I think production has billed Eric as the dumbest survivor of all time. And that's why we describe him that way. But had we not had this quote propaganda, if you will, maybe we wouldn't think of him as harshly 
uh, in that term, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Eric got branded as the dumbest survivor of all time. And let me just say, like, uh, Eric is is not a dumb person. And Eric is uh, not even close to the dumbest survivor. I mean, listen, I am on social media. Like, uh, <laughs> have you seen what some of these... I mean, some of these survivors are, uh, like... Uh, like not to like you know um sh shame people, but uh, like some of these survivors are are like illiterate. Like uh, I don't even <laughs> think, you know there are like so many like really dumb survivors. Like Eric can like is a coherent person. So um no he he made he made a move and uh, they ran with it as like it became like a greater story. But no, I, I don't th I like uh, and you could certainly question the move. But I do think that history, I, I think in some ways, has been kind to Eric Reichenbach, because I think that when you look back at what he did in Survivor Micronesia, could you not say that Eric Reichenbach was going full tilt boogie? <laughs> <laughs> I think you would say he was going full tilt boogie. I mean, you make a really great point that look at everything that happens after Micronesia. We we are littered with dumb moves here across the board, I think. Yeah. He's like the, he's like a he's like a, the gateway drug, if you will. Like he he kind of like lets it all through after him. And to the point where dumb moves happen so often it's even hard to even kind of think of the dumbest move or there's it, there's so many more that it's so saturated because people can make so many more decisions about advantages and yeah. stuff too. Well, can I just say uh that look like Eric, people want to chastise Eric Reichenbach. Oh, Eric, the biggest idiot ever. Didn't he, he gave up his immunity for a chance to win the game to get to the final four. Now these people win the final four immunity challenge and they, do, and they don't give up their immunity. And then they're like, Oh, Natalie, why didn't you give up your immunity at the final four? You idiot. Don't you know that's what you need to do to win the game? Yeah, and and it's 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 wild to think that like uh, people are constantly being asked to take like big risks and to perhaps usurp Eric in the dumbest move category. Mm -hmm. And people have given up immunity before. Rob, on your own season, Jenna Maraska uh, gives up immunity at one point. Did you think that was dumb at any point? That Jenna gave up her immunity for look. Um... <laughs> Uh, that th there has been like a lot of like commentary about that. I've seen people call that like a, a brilliant move because that then, uh, that totally, you know, threw, threw us off. Cause we, if we, if we were going to vote for Heidi and then Jenna gave her the necklace, like, uh, oh, what would, what do we do now? We don't know what to <laughs> like, uh, like we wouldn't just vote for the other one. So uh, it was, I thought it was silly um, to say it was like such a, like, I think that, um, you know, I think the Jenna like one, like um, wanted to, like she like at the same, you know, is going to also be the same person she had wanted to leave the game. Heidi, I like, I think was like definitely like open to getting the, the necklace. And I think that Jenna liked the idea of like being the first to do that at the time. So, you know, it wasn't, I, I didn't think it was a dumb move or a great move. I think it was just like, okay, I, I'm going to do this because I can. Mm, yeah. Hey, Cause it is, it, it is definitely one of the, like the fun facts that like, uh, while there have been two very notable people who have given up their individual immunity and been voted off, the other one's a winner. <laughs> so it's like, it mm -hmm. really does kind of say, maybe that's what Eric was thinking about uh, at the final five. He remembered Jenna Maraska and was like, and remember the people on the message board saying that maybe perhaps it was a brilliant move all along. And that is actually what happened. She's mm -hmm. the silent fifth member, like sixth member of the and Black can I say that brigade. I had I won the immunity, like uh, just not to go totally like off the rails here, um, but that that immunity challenge at the final six in Survivor of the Amazon, it was like shuffleboard. And I was like right there in pole position and freaking Butch knocked uh, like uh, my piece out of the way and knocked Jenna like into onto the X where Jenna got the individual immunity. But had I won it, I would have given it to Christy. I was considering that I would give my immunity to Christy to get her to vote with us that night. And I think she would have done that. Wow. 
And Survivor history could have forever been changed. Survivor history would have been changed. I would have voted out Jenna or Heidi in that spot. And I think that that gesture would have meant a lot to Christy. And I think she would have voted with us. Wow. I think that that's actually a brilliant move. And I wonder if like, you know, because the Christy move is like considered such a reference point for people even in the future. Like, does Dolly get voted off in the same way in Vanuatu if Christy yeah, isn't the I victim don't know. here? Um, it's, it's interesting. Like it was like a, like a cool thing happened, at, but like Butch would tell you that we were dumb that we didn't just vote out, uh, Jenna that night. Like, uh, like uh, for years I talked to Butch, he's like, we should have just voted out Jenna. Like that's where we blew the game right there. It's like, uh, uh you know, whatever. Always maybe, Monday. maybe not Butch. <laughs> it's always, uh, Monday morning quarterback. Oh, right. yeah. It's Very always much... easier to say it uh, in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Easier to say. Yeah. And, you know, if, if, if yeah. Jenna is, is even voted off at, at the final six and vote, it just doesn't win. I think we don't even think about the moment that much. So it is very, very mm -hmm. uh, interesting. And again, not to do a whole podcast about Survivor the Amazon. To me, I was always scared of Heidi. Heidi would, to me, was always the danger, not Jenna. Yes. It, I was always concerned about Heidi. And who knows? Maybe Heidi, me, Heidi could have won the game. Yeah, well, and then, and I actually would like to say this as another blonde fifth placer. I feel like based on Heidi's edit, she could have also probably been called at one point the dumbest survivor of all time, despite actually being one of the Very power players mm -hmm. there. But like again, I think the way that well, she's she built yeah. the confessionals, the the story that she's been given is that she actually does not know what she's doing. Um, and I think like Eric, and it's like it's you could galaxy brain so far that you look stupid when actually you had a good reason in your mind at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She know? misspoke a couple of times in confessional. Then they like <laughs> did, you know, aired everything to try her to make her look as bad as possible. And she actually, I, I thought was like one of the savvier operators, uh, like in the entire game. Yeah. I think that that makes sense. And I think it's actually very interesting to think about, um, if 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 Heidi was billed as the dumbest survivor of all time and they were playing just her quotes in the promotions instead of Eric mm -hmm. giving up immunity to Natalie. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, to 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 connect the dots between so many seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, maybe like I, I don't know. This is like the back door. You thought you knew Heidi Strobel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I do think that like, uh, you know, it's probably like, a, you know, uh, a, a a gendered discussion of like as a as a woman, especially a woman with, you know, uh, you know, blonde hair and some surgical augmentation. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, the audience will really respond to if we make her look bad. And so I, I but I really feel like that she was somebody who never took her eyes off the prize and was just a real hardcore player who was uh always working on something. Well, you know, Heidi might have thought it was a bad edit. I thought it was absolutely incredible. <laughs> I think that, you know, I would like to think that if I went on Survivor that I could do well and make a good showing for myself. But I know they could put together a Heidi edit for me if they really mm -hmm. wanted to. And I would just live in the fear of, They could oh, do it no. to anybody. I'm, they could do it to anybody. What am I going to do to set it off today, you know? Mm -hmm. Well... Wrapping up the You Thought You Knew Survivor Amazon. <laughs> Kevin, do you want to give us some quick hits on Eric's history on the show for those who may not have seen Micro or Caramon that recently? Sure. Um, uh, Eric Reichenbach, uh, Ice Cream Scooper, maybe the most one of the most iconic uh, uh, careers to go into Survivor. Uh, Ice Cream Scooper from Michigan. He is on the fan tribe in Micronesia. Yes, and from he hell, Michigan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he is you know kind of the starstruck naive like fan like that's that's the characterization we kind of get from him he you know is very excited to be there with ozzy who he kind of looks up to and you know he makes it very far he went by the time he wins his third immunity challenge he's convinced by the black widow brigade to give up his immunity uh to natalie uh and uh he is then promptly voted off in you know, a real first in Survivor because it's the first time we like saw all the votes. Uh, there was no suspense in in that sense, um, and so he was very much known for that time. And we're also at that moment where James Clement then uh, exclaims out loud, "I thought I was the dumbest Survivor of all time." Uh, and then we have him returning five years later on another fans versus favorite season. This time as a favorite, he goes very far in the season, uh, gets all the way to the final five before being medevac. So. Uh, two fifth place pos uh, 
uh, placements Placements. for Eric Reichenbach. Mm -hmm. So, Rob, what are some of your favorite Eric moments? What comes oh, to mind? I, I mean, so, I mean, Eric has so many great moments in Survivor or Micronesia. I mean, I feel like um, that there are, I mean, he has so many light moments in um, Survivor or Micronesia. And by contrast, very few in Survivor fans versus favorites. Um, there's the moment when we get to um, his brother comes on the family visit and he's like, that's Jeff Probst right there. Look at that. Um, You know uh, that he goes to the village and uh, you know, he has interactions with the, with the uh, women who I think maybe topless. uh, Yeah. It's like the the lunch lady has her boobs out essentially. It's his, it's his perspective. Um, When they have the auction in survivor Micronesia and then he wants to uh, lick Ceri's fingers. uh, And I believe that, um, James Clement uh, says, "Like uh, the, that boy is not all right." <laughs> <laughs> it felt very Hank Hill uh, from King of the Hill as There's well. There's something Just wrong with like, that boy. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is this is so weird. And I also remember because it's such a one of my favorite Suri moments as well is that uh, when Eric, he's, he's the one who I think suggests to lick Suri's fingers. Is like mm-hmm. I, I would pay, and he's like I like. Uh, she's like for like uh, twenty dollars, and he go and she goes like twenty dollars for each finger. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, and it, I think they settle like 40 or 60 for, for all of it. Yeah. Um, so I think Eric has so many fun moments. And then I, I think, you know, Caramon, he is such a smaller edit, but you know, he's like the one that actually has the moment where he spoils Malcolm's like idol, like the, the three amigos tribal council. Cause he's the one that says, well, like if we don't vote for them, they could just like pocket these. So we might as well just vote for them. Yeah. And um, so like, He's, he does stuff there too. Go ahead. Yeah. Rob. And so I think he does have like, uh, so to say that he doesn't know the game, I think is um, not uh, the uh, correct take, but I do feel like that there's a lightness about him in survivor Micronesia that is gone in survivor Caramoan uh, when he comes back 10 seasons later. And, you know, survivor does a very good job uh, now compared to what they used to do in terms of like, thinking about like the mental health of its participants and tries to, you know, do a lot to not like bury the, you know, the participants and they, they really, you know, they, they say it. And I think they also like live up to what they say in terms of the edit. But I I think that survivor, you know, forget the, the fans online survivor i I think uh did a lot to you know uh bully eric reichen back right i think that's a a pretty apt way of describing it uh i think you're totally right he has this lightness 22 when he shows up in in uh, fans versus favorites and in Caramoan, he's so serious. Um, and I think I would be too, after going through public humiliation like that, you are going to probably be a little more on edge than you were the first time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think my favorite Eric moment, uh, is in Caramoan. I think it connects with his seriousness. It's at final tribal where he gets into the argument with, uh, Sherry and Sherry tells him to sit down while she's asking for a million dollars from the jury. I think mm-hmm. it's absolutely incredible. You know, my first job was also being an ice cream scooper. So yes. I very much connected with Eric over that. And Sherry gives me the energy of like fast food. Franchisee. Yeah, she like owns, like manager. Manager. She, she like yes. owns the ice cream shop that Eric works right. at so, in this universe. So I was oh, yeah. exactly imagining she owns Sherry. She the Dairy Queen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sherry was yelling at one of her employees who was giving her back talk. You know, yeah. I, I was transported in that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Do you think Eric, what, so actually, Nigel, do you think Eric would have, what type of coworker do you think he would have been if you both were working at Cold Stone or whatever? I think I was probably Eric because I also did cross country and track when I was in high school. So I, I was the Eric at that Cold Stone. I don't know who like Suri was or <laughs> Parvati at the Cold Stone, but I think I was Eric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Rob, any other moments come to mind for you with Eric? Um, I'm trying to think back to um, 
you know, of course, you know, we have er everything that's from the iconic uh, bit with uh, the necklace, which I'm sure uh, we'll talk about. But, you know, he's just um, uh, a guy who was just so easy, like of the fans in Survivor fans versus favorites. I mean, really, um, he's the standout. I mean, he is, I believe, the only one from that tribe to return to the game. And, um, you know, it was a tribe of, you know, like not, you know, one of Survivor's finest tribes in its history. Uh, and he was just like the one like real like and Natalie Bolton almost came back. She was out on the beach for Heroes versus Villains. But he was like the one star from that season from the fans tribe. Yeah, I think that Eric is a big reason for why the theme works when you think of the fans you think of eric not just because he makes it so far and is a part of a big moment but he is starstruck he looks up to ozzy he has the excitement of beating ozzy to the beach i think and it's the first yeah. uh uh immunity challenge so mm -hmm. I, I think that they the show probably really enjoyed having eric there to make fans versus favorites really uh, a theme that people could like glom on to. And you know, people talk about Micronesia as like the first modern season. And I would say, you know, Eric is so known for his eagerness, his enthusiasm to be there. It's the, the show is getting so referential at this point because like Eric can talk about like what this means and, and fans can relate to his experience about kind of like, you know, uh, uh, just not being able to handle Jeff Probst and his brother in the same space. Like what I would do if I was. Yeah. And, you know, now think about like Survivor into the 40s. You know, everyone's a super fan. Everyone's excited to be there. Everyone's right. looking at a Jeff's palm. Like he's like the first person to really kind of suggest that as like a way that we should even be treating our fans and thinking about our fans on television. Yeah, that's really an interesting point because at in Survivor of the Amazon, it was like, hey, like we're not doing any of that. So like don't act at all like that this is like a show, that there's been other seasons. And this is really like the in fans versus favorites. This was the first season where it was sort of like, oh, oh you know, okay, wow, well, I am starstruck right now because I am here on the beat. I guess it's the first time, I guess, well, people, we had Stephanie and Bobby John came back uh, but other than that, you know, it's the first time that people are playing the game with people that they've watched on television. Yeah. And do you recall if you were like an Eric fan from the very beginning, Rob, like what was your journey with Eric as a, as a, as a, as yeah. A so in survivor fans versus favorites, I had just, I had been a little bit out of, uh, the watching like week to week. And I sort of like was, I was tuning in to see people I knew, but I, you know, I remember him being like one of the people that really popped on the show. And so he was an easy character to root for. Yeah. And, and I, I remember like liking him enough, but you know, I just remember when Eric came onto the scene, you know, he's a super fan, but he's like, he's like a super fan for like the survivalists and the challenge people. Not, he's not like, he's not, so, he didn't feel like someone who's like on sucks you know, like I was, right? So like, I didn't have to connect with him in those same ways. So I was very much rooting for, I think probably Amy to stay over him in the pre-merge, but I, I think- he by threw Amy under the bus. It's his most vicious move um, of, of, mm -hmm. of all time. Um, and so like, you know, we get all the way to, you know, the and I, I kind of always appreciated him as a character. Um, and then the moment happened, and I, I recall very vividly my mom's reaction to the Eric Blindside. And she's like cackling all over the place. Like it was like, this is crazy. Cause you know, they, they cut to him and he has his fingers crossed as each of the women keep voting for him. Like it's like a real work of art. I just remember it being so big. And I think in Caramoan, you know, to me, he's the most anticipated person to return out of that batch by far. I was most fascinated with him, even though I probably liked like Brenda more just because she's probably close to my personal taste. But mm -hmm. like to have Eric there, I mean, it was so exciting. Yeah. And, you know, I watched Micro being spoiled. So I already knew what was coming, which you and know, you I, knew about the Eric move as well. And yes, I knew okay. about the Eric move. And so I, I wish I had been able to go in blind and like not know what's coming and, and get to, you know, experience all of the shock and amazement. But, you know, watching it for the first time, knowing what's going to happen, I really had a close eye on Eric the whole time. And, you know, I knew he did cross country and he was an ice cream scooper. So I was like, this, this is my guy. I got to be paying attention. And, you know, we, we talk, we're, we're posing the question, was Eric a, a dumb survivor player? You know, he's in the minority 
in both of his seasons. It happens along the way. And he's able to get to final five both times. You know, I think he, he should get credit for being able to play a game where he is in the minority at times and still able to at least, you know, work his way enough to get pretty far along. Yeah, I think it's really impressive. And I think, you know, if I'm Eric and I was being called, I was the dumbest. I'd be like, well, I got fifth place twice. There's someone who's been voted off first twice. I don't know why I'm being called the dumbest survivor of all time. So, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, Eric's a very interesting figure. Um, uh, Rob, did you, do you recall any of your thoughts about Eric going into Karamoan or by the time the Kar by Karamoans and your thoughts about him as a, as a character? Yeah, I mean, um, and probably like those are documented uh, somewhere in the podcast annals. Um, but the thing, the exciting thing about Eric was that he, it was the promise of, okay, what does this look like to see Eric who came into Survivor born out of a fans versus favorite season to be born as a fan and return as a favorite? And how would he be changed by his experience after, you know, uh, for so many years that he was besmirched as the dumbest Survivor ever? And I think what we saw in Survivor Karamoan was a person that was very scarred by his experience in Survivor Micronesia to the point where, like, I think that he was almost at times, like, paralyzed in terms of like, his uh, ability to make decisions where he almost did not want any sort of agency in terms of decisions that were made. He would, during that season, you know, lean on other people, whether it was Andrea, whether it was Brenda, and he would say right before Tribal Council, point to a name on the flag and I will vote for whoever you tell me to vote for because I think that he did not want to be, you know, uh, out there like that again, where that they would be able to say like, ah, Eric, we got him again, idiot. We duped him. And so I almost feel like that uh, you know, as the game went on, he uh, did not want to be on the wrong side of things again. Yeah, I, I I think you're right on that. And I also think, you know, there are other people who are on the favorites tribe in Karamoan that also have that also come back trying to redeem themselves in some way. And 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 like Eric are like kind of concerned about how their first game went. Uh, because Andrea and Cochrane both play with returnees in their original season. Mm -hmm. And they their foot is like on the gas a lot more. And and Eric's like kind of the opposite. Like he takes a very different perspective than Andrea, who I think in many ways thought her game was unraveled because she did not do enough. And Eric was like, it's because I did too much. So I'm going to now, you know, do be breaks. more backseat, be more under the radar. And um I think that there's a very interesting duality there. And it's like, well, Andrea returns you know, a few seasons later. And I think pr the produ production, I think, liked the people that were going to keep pushing more in the same way that I think in Cambodia, you see a lot of juxtaposition in a lot of the promos between Kelly Wentworth and Kelly Wigglesworth as as which one is like really trying to be more gamey and is fighting really hard to be there. And so I think they, you can really do start seeing a shift in, in the way that production really kind of wants its returnees. And I think Eric also has a connection to that because his ingenue, star-eyed, naive character doesn't work on a return because how can you recapture that? And, you know, I think it's actually kind of interesting, uh, Kevin, you, you mentioned some of the other players uh, on Caramon with him as returnees. Uh, Cause I think that Eric is not just influenced by his uh, exit within the game, but also the edit that he receives. How would yeah. that not you know, way on you. And you also have Brenda there who does not get a large edit in Caramon as well, but she makes the comments about like, oh, look, I was nice this time. You know, thinking about the way she had been perceived and how that's going to impact the way she plays the game uh, on her return as well. Yeah, they're like so much more aware, I think. You know, Philip is super aware. He's like referencing the Boston Rob rules. Like, the, 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 I think that's actually one reason Caramon is, in my opinion, part of the dark era because I think it's it's a, it does not feel nearly or organic as some of the other seasons um, do. So uh, so I think we need to kind of jump in and, and discuss kind of like how Eric is being perceived by the fan base, you know, now versus then to really kind of figure out like how, you know, this legend really became to be what it is. Um, so I did some research. Um, as you 
two may recall at the Heroes versus Villains reunion show, Eric was nominated for dumbest move in Survivor history. Rob, he doesn't do you, win it. He doesn't. He win. doesn't win it. Yeah. What? It, what? Do you have a reaction to that? N- yeah, I later? mean, um, I, it, I think that it was just recency bias. The JT giving the idol to. Right, and that could be a you thought you knew also. Um, you know, in terms of like, was that was that that bad of a move? Um, ultimately, but um, yeah, that wins. That that JT gets it. So Eric doesn't even get the freaking award for dumbest move. Yeah, but production does not play that moment for JT over and over and over again the way that no. they do for Eric. No, they don't. You know, so much of the, you know, Eric is the dumbest survivor ever, I think is really from the survivor machine. Um, you know, going back and, you know, watching, I was watching like some media clips uh, from it. And, you know, James ends up like saying like, I, uh, I guess I'm not the dumbest survivor ever now. Um, and, you know, he goes and Eric goes out. And like the next day, you know, he does the media junket and, I was watching like uh, there's like this reporter and he's like, we're here with perhaps the dumbest survivor ever, Eric Reichenbeck. Uh, And this is back when they used to do the episodes like so the episodes used to air on Thursdays uh, at that point in time. And then the, the finale show was on Sunday. And I'm pretty sure like at the reunion show. You know, Jeff is, you know, uh, referring to Eric probably a bunch as like, uh, like, oh, OK, he made the dumbest move and he's here. Uh, it's Eric Reichenbach. And, um, you know, that there was so much of like the show telling us what to think if this happened in the middle of the season. Like, I feel like that maybe it's not talked yeah. about as much. Yeah, and I think it's it's it so totally cements that the Black Widow Brigade, which is considered one of the smartest alliances of all time, now gets to be the um, the counterpart to that, right? Whereas like any other random quote dumb player, dumb moment, I don't think it, it doesn't live in infamy as much when you don't have like, well, who are the smart people who took advantage or exploited the moment as well? Mm-hmm. And you know, now that I think about it. He's also probably unlucky that it happens in the penultimate episode of the season, correct? Because if Micro had been a final three, RIP series chances, (laughs) if it had been a final three, this move probably happens in the finale. And then afterwards, you're having to dedicate more of the coverage of what happens there to the actual win in, in how the season ends. So you don't get as much standalone time for Eric in this moment. It's kind of like a a perfect reason why I think that I would like the final five to be its own episode because I think there's so much that can happen in the end game. And now quite often we're, it's like, it's just part of a finale. So um, uh, it was really nice that that it gets its own moment. I actually did also some research and found, you know, what are the moves that are considered the dumbest? So I'm kind of going to go through this list. I want, you know, to kind of hear from the two of you, whether you think this is dumber or why it's dumber or not compared to Eric's decision. Okay. Um, first, we'll do the James's two idols being voted off with two idols. Reactions? Is it dumber? Um, I would say that this is more dumb. I mean, for James, there's three votes left. He has two idols. Um, I feel like that for James, um, you know, maybe you could say nitpick it like, okay, play one because uh, there's a chance that you're James, even though James has never won individual immunity that you could win one of the other immunities. So if you have any sort of doubt, play the idol. But um, that wasn't how James was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that, Rob. It's like, to me, it's like 50-50 chance, play it this time or play it next time. And unfortunately, it was just wrong. It's like he should have had the foresight, but it's like, it's it's there's still a, there's an argument to like keeping them. And and I don't know, for Eric, it's like, what's the argument to really holding on to his immunity necklace? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. What about the JT letter, Rob? You said that uh, this was only the dumbest because of recency bias. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, for, I guess we, and we really haven't talked through like Eric's motivation for why he did what he did, which I l- would like to, you know, have uh, during this conversation. Um, JT, I feel like, um, you know, misses some signals uh, in terms of like that they make a lot of assumptions. Uh, there was no reason why they needed to give the idol to Russell, uh, you know, and a lot of people have argued like, hey, that was an aggressive move. Um, but like, I feel like that for for 
like JT could have just played the idol for Russell. Like uh, he didn't need to go. Uh, well, I guess he needed he needed Russell to play it at that tribal council and idol poverty out of the game. I guess, um, <laughs> but um, it was questionable for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they were working off a lot of assumptions there. Yeah, and it's it's like it's it's I think in the sense of you think about it, dumb is like un, unreasonable or unnecessary. Yeah. It you is like what? one of the more unnecessary moments. J, JT's move was worse <laughs> <laughs> because at least Eric got tricked. JT played tricked himself. himself. <laughs> no, nobody told him to do that. He came up with that bad idea on his own. Like, I mean, look, like, uh, what do you sit there and 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 deal with like a Suri and Parvati, like manipulating you the whole day? Like, uh, I have to give Eric the benefit of the doubt. Like, JT made up this whole story himself. Yeah, I, you know, I'm willing to say that I think, yeah, JT definitely makes the the dumber move when talking it out because, um, you know, had Parvati not had that second idol. Does does she, does she make the same decisions at the final ten in Heroes versus Villains? Probably not, because or well, what if she just plays it on Sandra and not Jerry? Like JT could not go home at final ten had he just kept it. So it is very it's, stupid. It's a very <laughs> uh, big moves itis kind of a play. I think I've been convinced, Rob. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder if anything will beat that one, and we'll get into the specifics of Eric's. I think just to kind of make sure we 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 touch that as, after this um other uh dumb movements that are listed here that are commonly referenced colby taking tina to the final two um i don't think it's dumb i think it was uh, a purposeful choice knowing that he was not likely to win i think if he was under the impression that that was the winning move for him i would consider that dumber but it felt more like he was at he, peace he with knew. it yeah yeah, I don't think he minded losing to Tina. And I think he thought that, hey, um, I am going to, like, I think they really couldn't stand Keith. But I think he felt yeah. like, hey, my win is ultimately going to be becoming a Hollywood movie star. Like, there are 40 million people a week watching this show. And I am going to, you know, turn this into the the million dollar prize is not my win. My win condition, if you're called me. Yeah, he's playing the long game in, in yeah. the way that, like, I think Sugar was also trying to do that in Gabon, right? But I think Colby, you know, is able to make a loss into a win. He, like, won the Hearts of America, essentially, um, with that decision. Um, Tyson voting himself out is on the list. <sighs> you know, um, like, I feel like uh, to hear Tyson talk it through, like, uh, you know, he he felt like that there were reasons uh, why that made sense. I mean, clearly, like, he made a bad decision, but Tyson's not a dumb player. So um, I can't say that that was the, the dumbest move. I will agree. I don't think it's the dumbest move. And to be honest, I've I've watched it many times. I, I've watched like a YouTube video on it before, and I still kind of get confused about <laughs> the logistics of we everything. And, and I've been eating regularly. And right? it's like, so I can't. Wait. It's like half an episode as well. So it's like it, it splits time with a different tribal council. So it's very confusing. So I, 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 I've never thought it was that dumb. I think it's it's just like a kind of little result oriented thinking as well. Um, we have Jason and the stick, which I guess, is it just believing the idol is real? Yeah. What's the dumb part of it that, that he thought it was a real idol? I think so. If you ask Eliza, maybe. Yeah. I think Eliza <laughs> would argue it's the, the dumb move. Yeah. It's like uh mistake in something. Well, because the little face. On. And I, I will always, say, I think Eric plays a better game than Jason does. So like, sure. So I, I think Jason plays one of the worst games maybe ever. Um, of, of people who make it to the merge, especially by that point in Survivor history. So, um, you know, it's always been hard for me to say that Eric's move is the dumbest when, well, Jason is right there making dumber moves. And and from his, his same tribe, his spiritual successor, Eric's spiritual successor exists in Carrie Moen, and that's Eddie Fox, who does not seem, seems like also to play a much weaker game than than Eric does overall. So it's like, I think sometimes Eric's a little benefited by having some of some good reference points some control variables, if you will. Mm hmm. Uh, I also have Ian quitting is, is quite often listed as, as one of the dumbest moves. Rob, what do you think about that? No, I, I don't think, you know, in the case of Ian and, and Ian is probably a good parallel with Eric where, you know, you have these people that are, you know, very, you know, um, you know, emotionally vulnerable 
at a very late stage in the game, day 36 for Eric, day 38 for Ian, and the being sort of like, uh, you know, browbeaten by people that they have had close relationships with that are, you know, older than them in age. And Ian had really been, you know, going through it with Katie and with Tom and, he felt like that, hey, if I just like give up my shot here, uh, then everything will be, you know, right with um, Ian or with Katie and with Tom. And so for him, I think that that was that was fine. Uh, and he's gone on to do, you know, a lot of great things. And I don't think that necessarily he regrets it as something that he should have done. You know, Tom should have won that season. And so. I don't know if like uh, the per if the guy who did it doesn't think it was like the dumbest thing, then I think it's hard to say that that was the dumbest decision. Yeah, because he's not talking. He's not like James Clement saying it's dumb out loud, giving the sound bite for for the producers. Um, and I and I, I agree with you, Rob. It's like I think it's like in the Colby vein of things, where it's like for him, he had a different objective, and so like, is yeah. it dumb if he reaches objective? I think from some people living, you know, in their own homes and the comfort of, 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 of typing on the internet, you know, they would say that like the fact that that is his objective is dumb when you have a million dollars on the line. But at the end of the day, Ian's at peace with it. So I think it's hard to call it dumb, maybe yeah. uh, misguided theoretically, uh, you know, but yeah, like it's, you know, it's really hard when we talk about these things on podcasts, you know, it's very easy to get into sort of binary. Like the only reason to go on survivor is to win Everyone, there's only one winner. Everyone else is a loser. If you lose, you're dumb. If you win, you're smart. Every move that the winner made was smart. And, you know, that these are human beings. And, you know, like in the context of their lives, where now in some of these cases, we can see like 20 years down the road of how it turned out. The winners weren't always the winners in life. And the losers like weren't always the losers in life. And so... People made decisions that didn't necessarily result in them winning a million dollars, but, you know, that they were decisions that, you know, it changed the way the trajectory of people's lives and, and informed us about like the way that they were going to go on and live their lives. And for Ian, like win at all costs just wasn't like what that guy was about. And, you know, something that I always loved about the Ponderosa videos that we used to get was getting to see people reflect on their experience. And so often you see the appreciation they have for just getting to participate. And it's very clear that people are looking for many different things out of the experience and they do get a lot of different things out of it. So I, I agree. Ian, Ian, is, you know, it's kind of a, a Cody Calafiore move of, I know that I'm I'm not going to win by this, but this isn't that's not the point of this move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and then uh, also here I've got just like three more left. Uh, Brandon giving up immunity later um, in South Pacific um, is that Ooh, yeah is that a uh, dumber move? Because he's also <sighs> tricked, kind of. There's like manipulation by people who are older than him. There's a lot of parallels here. I feel like. There are a lot of parallels here. And then they end up going on to be allies in uh, like they're working together, uh, Brandon and Eric. Like Eric is like Brandon's uh, closest ally. You know, it's it's hard because this is like I, I maintain that Brandon like did not belong on Survivor. Uh, certainly not the first time. And definitely he was not in the right state of mind to be playing Survivor the second time. And then the like what happens to him, like I feel like is actually like probably worse than what happens to Eric because we get into like a lot of like, what does your family want you to do? What does God want you to do? Like, uh, like I do think that, and, and, I, and I do really like coach, but I think that kind of like what happens with Brandon is a little gross uh, in terms of where coach is going to go to God to get an answer on what Brandon should do. And just the fact that he is just um, a bill that, you know, so malleable where, you know, uh, that he is uh, so easily manipulated by, you know, coach and Albert in that spot to do what they want him to do. And his like uh, misplaced like faith that God is going to steer him in the right way. And you see that he comes back 
angry uh, in his second season after like what happens to him. And I'm sure his family gave him a very hard time about all of that. So that's really like um, a joyless version of what happens with Eric, where there's a lightness to it, even though it there's a, you know, a dark underbelly of this where if for so many years, Eric is chastised like dumb idiot. Like there's no, not even in the moment. Is there any joy to be taken from the Brandon giving the idol to the necklace to Albert? Yeah, I think that's why you don't see that one plastered on the promos. <laughs> you know, like the Eric one is like you get all the fun reactions. Everyone's kind of laughing. You know, even Eric's kind of a good sport about it. He's like, mm-hmm. so you guys sport. drive me crazy. You know, yeah, like there's- that's like uh, <laughs> that is what we call a life lesson. Yeah, yeah like you're not doing I don't I, I I don't recall what was happening with with the with the brain and situation um, because I'm sure the jury was not having those types of reactions that were like positive and lighthearted. They were like, so oh, this is, like, will tell you. Brandon would have won the game. Like if he got to the end, like uh, that the, he was like a well-liked figure. Yeah. So it's like, it, it feels like people are going too far um, for this. And, and, and I, you know, I think I'm sure this really hurt coaches also winning chances as well. You could argue it was a dumb move on, on his part. Yeah. It's just a, a darker story overall with, uh, with Brandon. And I, and I recognize why the show has uh, continued to circle back to Eric. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the last ones I have here, we have Wu taking Tony, which I think is commonly referenced as maybe the dumbest. Do you think that is dumber than this move and the JT letter, Rob, now that you've had a chance to reflect? Yeah, I, I, I do think it's worse. I think it comes from, uh, you know, again, I, like I, I think Wu is a really nice guy. So I, I don't I don't want to like uh, say like, OK, this is the the you know, I, I'm more comfortable saying it's the it, it's the worst move more than the dumbest move. Uh, if that is like, uh, you know, being like a little less aggressive about it, uh, because I just feel like that based off of what we know um that i feel like that you know and and maybe from woo's perspective he felt like okay tony just burned trish and so tony rubbed a lot of people the wrong way he's the easier person to go with but i feel like that and Cass will tell you that she would have won if Wu would have brought her there but i feel like that Wu i think would have been able to and Cass might have been like very deadly in front of the final tribal council jury i mean she's a lawyer she might have been able to really you know, Wu, I, I don't think is a great public speaker also. And so um, he might have been, you know, had a tough time against Cass also. But I think that Tony just had such a a body of work that um, for Tony to be able to get him to buy into that the jury will not think it's honorable, like if he ends up voting out Tony, like I think it was like a master stroke from Tony's part. I I completely agree. It's he's able to give Wu a lane, like thinking about how are you pitching yourself? What do these people perceive you as? And I think it's completely logical for Wu to buy into the idea that he will be viewed honorably. He talks about uh, being, you know, really involved in like martial arts. And I remember when he goes to uh, the children's school uh, on reward, he connects with them a lot. And so I, I can really see Wu believing that this is the right move for him and unfortunately for him he was uh tricked yeah yeah and and you know I, I like the idea of it being the worst move because it's about like your game odds all of that rather than like you being boneheaded because there is a, there is a perspective here you know it's like it's it's not like it's a ridiculous assertion to make in living in the moment that like i mean we've seen jurors like juries mm-hmm. being hate people before so why why wouldn't this be a uh why yeah. wouldn't this be a possible so solution? i think that maybe uh, go, talking this through um you know like tony is a two-time survivor winner one of the greatest players to ever play the game eric is sitting there with with sari and with parvati two of the greatest amanda who's no slouch and ends up you know buying into what they're selling JT, <laughs> no, n- n- that if this was a tweet, n- <laughs> nobody Colin blank space. JT, I'm giving my idol to Russell for no reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh. I feel that JT like convinced himself of a bad idea, and maybe because of that, that's the dumbest move. Maybe the fans got it right. 
Yeah, maybe it's like it, it, democracy does work. You know, like we were actually able to figure it out. Yeah, you know, I feel like if somebody, if no, if you just do the dumbest thing and you and nobody convinced you, like I feel like that's worse than people who are really good at the survivor convincing you to make a bad move. Yeah, I think if any combination of Sari, Tony, and Parvati tricked me, <laughs> I'm not going to be embarrassed. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah, I'd rather be tricked by them than by like so, like a really like low level then like Russell figure. looking sad. <laughs> <laughs> like, look how sad he looks. Um, we, we are going to give him an idol. So um, this is the last one that it's quite often mentioned as a dumb move. I would argue maybe it is the dumbest because if we are starting to use the mentality that Ian's move is not dumb because he had a different objective and Colby's move is not dumb because he wanted to be, you know, have a Hollywood career afterwards. I will assert right now that I think perhaps the dumbest move then technically is Varner outing Zeke, which is commonly, you know, listed and I think it's it actually satisfies a lot of things that we were talking about here. It is unnecessary, unsuccessful. Um, it was his own idea. Your own idea that totally came to you. You're not being tricked. It is in the Colby Ian way. It's like it actually kind of really hurts you in the way that you're being perceived post show. It hurts your opportunities mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and you also got exceptionally early, where it's like it's like was the game even that good? So I I, I recognize that this is like a it's not nearly as fun to be calling it a dumb move, but I think you can, if, if we're being very serious about dumbness, if you could, if you could visit any survivor and contestant in history and be like, you're about to make the dumbest move of your life. Mm -hmm. I'd argue. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, yeah. The game yeah, changes yeah. one is that a, That's no? a really strong argument. Right? Yeah. And, and something is, and it ends up being like dumb, like beyond the game. Um, you know, it's like, you know, you, you could, like really, like uh, he would have gone, and people would have been, like had like fond memories of Jeff Varner across like three seasons of Survivor, and then to not only like cause harm to you know uh, Zeke and and you know uh, people like watching the show and and trauma to you know people um, you know to throw it all away for what for like other people are gonna say. Like, oh, wait, like, uh, he was uh, hiding something from us. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah. Zeke, how could you? How could you not tell us? Yeah. And like to have the entire tribe. We trusted just, you. I mean, it, it was so dumb that Jeff didn't even have a vote. Like, it's it's so dumb. It broke the rules of of of, of survivor conventionality in a, in a way. And so I think you could argue it is, it is even dumber. Um, but I know that we've kind of, talked about these in relation to Eric's move. I mean, Rob, how would you kind of briefly summarize, you know, I guess maybe Eric's perspective here? Cause he's at the final five and it yeah. seems like he wants to make a deal here. That's going to advance. Well, honestly, further. I feel like it's easier to understand now than it was then because so much of like, uh, it has to do with resume and the jury and, and you got to make a big move. You got to make a flashy move, Eric, you're drawing dead. Sure. You could keep winning. You'll get to the end, but you'll be a zero vote finalist. And so that the idea was that nobody could nobody could trust Eric. And so they sort of like browbeat him emotionally. Um, and there was a thought that he could like he was the most athletic of the five people left. And there's a thought that he could have won, won out based off of what the final I know the final three challenge ultimately was like stacking the dishes. I don't know if that's necessarily uh, was it stacking the dishes or it's, was it holding the, hold, the holding, holding, thing holding thing. so maybe Eric might have been uh, might have been good at that uh, although based off of some of the Peridium videos I watched Amanda had like the hack to uh, ultimately win that challenge mm -hmm. so maybe he could have uh, won out was it the final four challenge was stacking the dishes or am I thinking getting confused with China either way um, uh, I think four, yeah, four had water that was being um, the, uh, heroes versus villains. I think had maybe the stacking. Okay, at the end. E either way, so who knows if Eric would have won those uh, last couple challenges? But you know, they sort of talk him into no. all right. If um, if we if we you give up the necklace, you'll prove to us that you are you know that you're trustworthy again you'll win a lot of favor in the eyes of the jury um i i, I only remember that eric's like vertical vote is to vote for parvati uh so i don't know i guess he must have uh thought that 
that the other people were voting for poverty also here in this spot. And uh, you look, it's not the craziest thing that Amanda and poverty had been working together for a while. There's a lot of uh, like, he's with the group that's trying to, you know, um, vote them out when uh, Amanda finds that idol, I think at the final six. So yeah, he's trying to make a big move. Yeah, he is. And I, I will quickly say before anyone catches me in the comments that the 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 plate stacking is not the the final immunity challenge in Heroes versus Villains. It's that uh, that maze where the blind mm -hmm. maze from Amazon. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, so that's coming. So I How just want to clear forget? that up. You know, give a retraction very quickly. And if I recall, also with with this move, I've also heard people. I think. Uh, Josh Kettles had reached out to me yes. um, once before um, saying that he's an Eric Reichenbach like apologist, which is to say that the dumbest person actually in this situation is Natalie in his mind, because well, like Natalie's willing to kind of accept the next round to move on to the final four, where she's clearly at the bottom. I mean, she's being told by these people that they're, she's going to get voted off if she doesn't get Eric's immunity necklace. And so mm -hmm. it's like, why is she so committed to making sure Eric is being humiliated when you really try to be pushing Suri to join this because well, Amanda and Parvati are a tight final two. We voted against them in the last round at six. And, you know, obviously they did not know about the final two situation. But technically, if you, if you look back, maybe had Suri and Natalie actually followed through, you know, Parvati wouldn't be the winner of this season. And maybe one of them is in the final two instead. So it actually is kind of interesting to think about. This is not nearly as clean cut as, as maybe the internet or production has suggested it was. Mm -hmm. and, and the move is not meant to just advance yourself uh one more round the move is to set up a, a pathway to the end for himself you know he wins immunity in the previous round where they send home alexis he recognizes that he is you know on the verge of being pagonged here and you need to do something to get yourself to the end because i think if you're just going to rely on winning immunities down the stretch and not make any sort of effort to flip the game i think yeah. a lot of people would also call that a stupid move Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just looking at my notes from the evolution of strategy, you know, that they, uh, the, um, Natalie, like, approaches to Eric uh, about, you know, I have a harebrained idea, and it's crazy, and it's brilliant. What if me, you, and Sari vote Amanda tonight? Um, and then uh, she says, this is where it gets funny and tricky. You give me your necklace. He's like, I'm not even going to consider that. But they, like, work on him, like, throughout the whole day. Uh, you know, so everybody plays their part. Sari works on him. Uh, and Sari is like, I don't know, Eric. I don't know if I could trust you. Um, it's gonna take a big move to get me to trust you. Uh, and uh, like they're all like playing like good cop, bad cop, uh, like uh, big sister. And you know, it's like four people all like working on him. And Rob, I, I forget who it was that you had uh, an interview with, but it was someone who had written the article about the move itself several years Dalton ago. Dalton Ross? Yes, Dalton Ross did yes, like an oral with, history about it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that reminder. You know, the fact that it was so complex and so well done, I, I think we should think of that to give Eric a bit more credit here. If we we're taking an oral history to unpack the machinations and the roles that each of the players are, are having here. I think it, you know, it was like oceans 11. Yeah. This could happen to me. Yeah. And, and I think it's, 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 uh, you know, I don't think it's that stupid of a move when you take a step back. I mean, it, it's, it's not, the most intuitive move <laughs> in in the world right but um i'm i'm glad that as someone who gets to watch forever that it happened right that he follows the footsteps of ozzy and jason like that feels like a, a trio if you will um all get played by the black widow brigade and um you and know it, it it is just true it, it really is like a work of art so I, I think from a character perspective i'm really glad that it, it all happened i i uh wish eric was not dragged yeah. over the coals every time like the someone finds survivor micronesia on netflix or something and, and mm -hmm. tweets about it but like i think we should all like you know take it with a grain of salt that i don't think it's dumb as it is it is the fact that eric's willing to kind of lean into a little bit is like really nice of him because i think it's, it makes survivor probably a better uh 
Well, he was a good University. sport about it, certainly, like, at, at first. Uh, but I do think that, like, I feel like that the joke stopped being as funny for him, like, as the years uh, went on. I mean, they gaslit Eric to hell uh, at, at this trial council where it's like, we're mad at you, Eric. You've been, you've been telling so many stories to us. And he's got four people, like four, like uh, adult women, like, uh, like really like, uh, like on his case about things. It's like sort of these things where you hear about like people that get like scammed and it's not like, uh, you know, when you find out like what the scammers did and how like elaborate the scam was, it's not like, Oh, you idiot. Like how did you ultimately give your social security number to somebody? It's like, they said they were the IRS. <laughs> they said I was going to jail. They said letters. The phone number came up the IRS. Like I like, uh, you know, it's sometimes you just have to like tip your cap to the scammers. Yeah, that it's it's a really good scam. It's it's mm -hmm. it's it. You know, like if Enron did you in, are you are you stupid <laughs> or, or like uh, it's like it's like one of the greatest. Yeah, this wasn't the Nigerian prince <laughs> email that he fell for. This yeah. was a very elaborate scheme. And I, I also want to give Eric credit here because I, I think it's in the the Dalton Ross oral retelling that. Uh, Dalton Ross mentions that Eric didn't want to look at the jury after he said he was giving it up because he didn't want them to convince him to not do it by having reactions that would make him think it was a bad idea because he recognized that it was risky. And I think there's, I, I want to give him credit for recognizing that like, of course, this could end up being a bad idea, but I'm here to, to play and I'm here to make a move. And sometimes you do want to take the risky move because yeah. it can pay off and it pays off for plenty of people, but it does not pay off for everyone. And Rob, do you think that Eric wins had like, because a lot of people talk about he could have theoretically won at the end on either of his season. I feel like I've heard this being discussed before. Obviously he's going to an end game. If Natalie leaves at five with some of the best survivor players of all time, do you think he, is this actually like a game ending move truly? Um, or what's your, what's your take on that? I mean, if Eric gets to the end, if he wins out, I do think that he potentially, uh, is the winner of the season. Um, but it's so hard to, to say that like, so many different things have to change. I think that maybe less so in survivor Caramoan. Um, but I mean, like if he goes on and wins, like wins out, like you have people like Ozzy on the jury and, uh, you know, Siska, you know, it's a final two also. So I think that that kind of helps him, um, you know, if he's up against say like, uh, you know, Amanda or Parvati, um, like I do think that there are going to be, you know, uh, votes for him there. Yeah. I mean, it's like that, it's the underdog, um, you know, effect I think is very real. I remember actually listening to, uh, Kara Moen on RHAP. Cause I think that's the first season I, I found RHAP and, uh, a lot of talk about like, is Eddie Fox secretly a jury threat? Because like he has all these allies on the jury. He hasn't really betrayed anyone. And I think Eric kind of has a bit of that in Micronesia. I wanted mm -hmm. to quickly jump into uh, just kind of wrap up this segment here about kind of how, you know, we currently see Eric. I found a popularity poll from 2016, which ranked every single contestant's um, uh, uh, appearance on Survivor by the subreddit voters. Yes. Um, Eric Karamoan ranks 162 out of the 575 contestants of the time. This is in 2016. So he is in the 28th percentile. So he's top third. So fairly popular. But his Micronesia outing, he's 50th overall, which means he's in wow. the ninth percentile. So he's a top 10% character, one of the best um, at the time. Um, are any of these surprising to either of you? Uh, I think it makes sense that his micro appearance is generally more like than the Karamoan. And I don't think it's surprising because his most memorable moment is unfortunately for him, his humiliation. But I think that the fans really appreciated him for, you know, being a good sport, going through it anyways. And he's a part of like the show becoming even more legendary in uh, some some really incredible moments that we're getting to see. Yeah, Rob, 
Yeah, I mean, he did something uh, infamous and was, like, uh, humble about it and, you know, was a good sport. I mean, there was nothing not to love about Eric Reichenbach. And, you know, I think that uh, he was, you know, uh, adorable in his um, ultimately, uh, in his, you know, infamous, beautiful defeat. Yes. And so um, also this poll showed like demographics that tended to favor you or or over, you overperformed with. And his most favorable demographic in both outings is women. Women are far more likely to rank Eric higher than men are. So a significant boost from female uh, viewers. Maybe it's because he helped a lot of women get to the final yes. four. <laughs> and I think it's also, I, I remember watching, sorry, I think there's also people out there that kind of believe that what happened was a little cruel. Cause like Parvati actually is far more popular with, I think men than women at first. I think she's become more popular overall to everyone. But um, there were a lot of people that were very sympathetic to Eric. Um, and I, I, I think maybe men are the ones who are a lot more callous calling Eric the dumbest ever and, and holding it against him uh, online when they find out um uh, when they finally watch his episode because his least favorable demographic is people who had been part of the subreddit for less than a year. So probably like newer fans, people who have not really kind of casuals. taken a chance. The casuals, exactly. I don't would never do it. that. I would <laughs> never give up my immunity. Yeah. And so like, that's part of their, their perspective. Um, and so he's the ranked the fourth best in Karamoan after Malcolm, Andrea and Eddie. And he is the third best in Micronesia after Suri and Parvati. So I mean, that's a that's a big compliment there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, I would expect fans to rank Suri above me. I expect <laughs> to get scammed by Suri. I can't blame Eric for anything. I mean, look, was what happened to Eric worse than what Suri did to a bunch of these newbies on the traders? <laughs> right. We actually just finished the traders, and what a what a joy it was to watch. Mm -hmm. Oh, so so good. I hope Eric's and on Eric traders too. Eric was a way better sport than <laughs> a couple of these people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Eric actually should be the first person. Everyone who's booted from these shows should call and be like, "How did you handle this?" You know, like let me as a like a consulting capacity. You know. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, I just wanted to now kind of move into some of the historic reactions to Eric's boot. So I will say this in my research, it was very hard to find out how people felt about it at the time, because there it's been talked about so much since then that you're finding like yeah. all of the articles from like 2020, 2019. It's like, I, I just want an article from 2008. Um, all I could find was one blog um, where someone actually was very low on the moment. In fact, Alan Sepinwall. Uh, oh, Alan in, Sepinwall, yes. Yes. So in his blog, uh, right after the episode had aired, um, he mentions, I suppose I, I should be giddy about yet another ridiculous blindside at Tribal Council, but I'm actually starting to get numb to it. Virtually every major development of this game post-merge has come at the result of someone being colossally stupid. Jason <laughs> for thinking his stick wasn't just a stick. Ozzy for not even bringing the idol to Tribal Council, much less playing it. Jason for taking Natalie's word and not playing his idol. And in parentheses, and Natalie for being stupid enough to send him to Exile Island in the first place. Also, Alexis for being dumb enough to send Amanda to Exile Island. And now Eric for letting the women guilt and bamboozle him into giving up his necklace to Natalie. It's fun once or twice, but after a certain point, all these mistakes seem to be less of a reflection of the brilliance of Parvati, Suri, and company, and more of a sign of that there are a lot of stupid, stupid people playing in the game. Yeah. <laughs> and then, Call a rare cold take from Alex <laughs> at the wall. If, if Penner or Yaman were still there, aren't ni uh, neither of them are going to be fooled by any of this. And then he ends with, Eric deserved his fate, but this wasn't like Yule's band of four triumphing over the young idiots. It mm -hmm. wasn't any of kind of good versus evil parable. Eric wasn't bad. He was just a dumb, starstruck kid. Yeah. So I think that kind of reflects that you know, it was in a series of dumb moments, a climax of of, yes. of 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 the victims of the Black Widow Brigade um, that kind of adds to it. But I think there were certainly people out there that felt like this was a little cruel, yeah. if you will. May, may I, if um, I have, uh, I referenced earlier, I watched this news report. Uh, this is from WDEF, uh, which is apparently Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, that they did a news report with Eric Reichenbach. This is from his interview junket. Uh, if I may play this, uh, like this is from the day after the episode airs. 
Last night on Survivor, the last guy on the island was talked into giving up his individual immunity. Eric had a guaranteed ticket to the Survivor Final Four, but got played by what he says were four crazy, sexy women. Whoa. He joins us now <laughs> for our Survivor Spotlight. Hey, Eric, how are you? I'm doing good. I got to ask you, man, what were you thinking? I ask myself that sometimes. <laughs> um, I, I really... I, there's no one answer I can say that'll that'll make you understand this or make anybody understand this, including myself. I mean, it was a combination of things, and just there were the emotions going into it. I mean, I mean, they had been my friends for all those days out there. I considered them my friends, and I let that get in the way of my strategy. I let that blind me when I, in terms of winning the game or actually getting to the end. Now, James the Grave Digger last night said, "Now you're the dumbest survivor ever." Is that a fair assessment? That is that is right on cue. I mean, that is pretty dumb. That's way dumb. I mean, I, there's no question that was one of the biggest blend, blunders ever. And this is coming from a kid who's I've seen the show a lot. I've seen the show since the beginning. I mean, I study the thing, and there's there's no there's no redemption from that. It's just it's just off the charts. Well, unfortunately, you do have to take risks to win this game. But how will what happen? Yeah. So I mean, this is from the day after. Like, are you the are you dumb? And like that was the dumbest thing ever. Like, uh, like you're so dumb, right? Yeah, it's definitely like the narrative. And like he's totally just being like, you yep. know, what an interviewer yep. wants. It's like, yep, a hundred percent. I don't really mm -hmm. quite understand. I felt like he was like testifying before Congress at times. You <laughs> know, just like I, I don't, I don't. It was very hard. But, you know, he leans in and is just like, yep, yeah, you got me. And I think that's a much easier way to deal with it. If he's, you know, if he has to go talk show to talk show, fighting against them, building the case why he's not actually the stupidest and trying to pivot away, that's it's a little bit of a harder argument. And I think it, it really does make you more like likable for someone who can be humble and kind of like own the fact that like it was kind of a boneheaded move. Because I think like the opposite is someone who will like, it's, it's Russell Hans saying that, like, there's a flaw in the game. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, actually, it's, uh, <laughs> what you didn't see is it really was a good move, bup, 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 you know. Yeah, it's like a lot of the, like, actually, no, it was the most genius move you could ever imagine. And it's like, well, I think the reality is maybe you thought that, which I think Eric would testify, like, I thought it was a really, you know, incredible move. And then I realized um, when you take a step back and you observing out the outside, clearly it was dumb because that's why everyone else thought it was, like, What's going on in your head doesn't really matter. So does Eric describe them as evil, sexy women? Yes. <laughs> I guess A so. group of evil, sexy women. A group of evil, sexy women. It reminds me of uh, in BB4 when Julie Chen refers to uh, June and Allison as evil bitches. Oh, yeah, yeah, Just yeah. some like, outlandish mm -hmm. ways to des describe these contestants. <laughs> yeah, very much leaning in and... Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a very bold bold language. Um, I wanted to also mention that I found the RJP preview for Caramo and Raw. Oh, yes. What did I say? Where you talk about um, you and Nicole kind of give your assessment on people going on. Do you recall maybe how you felt about it before well, I read the receipts? I think it must have been. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it must have been. Uh, I, I would think pretty close to what I said earlier about how like that it was going to be interesting to see uh, what his how like the student has now become the master. Uh, I don't think I was high on uh, Eric Reichen back in his return, but uh, I don't know. What did I say? So in the preview, you mentioned that you feel pretty good about his chances. Yes. And Nicole mentions that, uh, that she believes he will not be targeted and that his hair had grown back from the heroes versus villains finale. Yes. Um, and yeah. He has the great like Farrah Fawcett hair. One of the most iconic hair, um, hair like hairdos ever if there was a survivor museum there should be like a wig of his somewhere in there because it's a beautiful mane if you just get his like profile and like guess that survivor player i think you could probably get it yeah oh yeah who's that pokemon of of eric's hair yeah um and so uh and the both of you agree that that he will last long because he's easy to manipulate uh and he's not gonna be calling the shots because he's very easy going and you actually the only worry you have for him rob is that you worry that he might feel a need to prove himself and therefore might actually- It was the actually... opposite. I, I was yeah. dead wrong about that. He went out of his way to like, hey, I am not going to. He's like somebody who, you know, he had his heart broken and then he's like, well, I'm not going to let anybody break my heart again. You know, I'm not going to like uh, allow myself to be vulnerable again. You know, he finds the idol and hands it to Andrea. And he's like, here, 
uh, I'm not going to like get, you know, duped with this. Like here, you, you, you take it. I don't want it. Yeah. And, uh, I also found, uh, uh, the know-it-alls episode after the Karamoan finale. Now, I think it's hard to find out like how people really felt about Eric right after his medevac mm -hmm. because it happens in the finale. So there's so much more to talk about. You have Teethgate, if you will. Like, there's a lot of like high priority items to yes. discuss. Yes. But I, I reviewed your like the summary of it, and so here are some of the highlights I wanted to mention. Yes, here because they revolve around Eric. Uh, in the segment that starts off with next, they talk about Dawn. Rob started to feel bad about uh, feel bad for her during the episode, and Stephen felt uh, Brenda's question to Dawn was way over the line. Uh, She's a out. <laughs> yes, uh, Stephen says that angry jury members have no intention of changing their vote, but want to humiliate the person. Rob thinks Sherry made the right move by telling Eric to sit down during yes, his jury yes. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really felt like that Eric's uh, medevac from the game, like I felt like it was sort of like, you know, uh, like psychosomatic uh, at the time. Um, and, you know, I had done interviews with Eric about this where, you know, I was like an amateur psychologist. But I felt like that Eric would have rather med gotten been medevac from the game ultimately then you know uh then then be like um ultimately like uh come up short again and you know we actually do get this really kind of foreshadowing confessional about him it's actually kind of a dark confessional he but climbs the tree yeah about like yeah. i kind of what if i got hurt and i had to believe i'm like in this beautiful paradise in this jail that i'm stuck in and if I got hurt, then there would be no shame if I was to leave. It actually kind of harkens again to former Survivor fan contestant Kathy Sleckman, who had been rumored to be someone who also like... His tribe um, Yeah, someone who had been rumored to like maybe consider like, well, if I hurt myself, like maybe I'll also get to leave the game. Um, though she just kind of quits outright. Um and you, you, it's interesting to say psychosomatic because in the summary, it also mentions how they refer, they talk about Eric's medical evacuation. Rob feels like it was psychosomatic, that Eric mm -hmm. couldn't take getting voted out of the game. Steven agrees. He thinks it could have been a panic attack after what happened to Brenda. Rob also feels that Eddie and Eric had no right to get on Sherry's case for being carried along. Uh, Steven respects Sherry's game because a fan needed to sit back in order to get to the end. And Rob says that Sherry didn't do herself any favors in her final arguments and that she should have explained her case better. Yeah. I also uh, that most the thing I remember most uh, is that we announced uh, that Nicole was pregnant on uh, the end of that podcast. Is that in your summary? Um, I think it's somewhere in there. It was not part of the because uh, when <laughs> yes. I controlled F, you thought Eric. you knew Dominic Sesternino. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's the origin point exactly. But well, I did want. Go ahead, Just the, 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 to go back to that night where that there was a lot of like hubbub about that people really thought Nicole and I were going to be on Survivor 27, which was blood versus water. And there was a lot of speculation about how people were leaving with their loved ones to be a part of Survivor blood versus water. And um, Nicole and I were moving uh, at around that time. We were moving to a bigger apartment because Nicole was with, was, uh, with child expecting and so I had been teasing, I, I had been playing into it a little bit about how we had a big announcement that we were going to be, uh, we were going to be making. And I also said, you know, that I was going to be moving. And so, uh, like we we're going to be like no podcasts, like coming up next week or whatever, because of the move, uh, and people really ran with that. We were, uh, going to be on survivor blood versus water. And so when we teased that there was an, a big announcement at the end of the podcast, uh, I think people were really expecting us to announce like, okay, I'm I'm going, I'm leaving for Survivor tomorrow. Uh, but instead, uh, the announcement was that Dominic was going to be, was coming. And that was uh, 10 years ago uh, this spring. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that you have Dominic in your life. I would have also enjoyed seeing you and Nicole on Blood vs. Water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was I was totally tricked. I was Eric Reichenbach <laughs> in the moment. I was yeah. like, oh my, we they're going to be there. And it's like you know, like we were know, contacted. We were, but but it was it was early on where I, I they didn't even say what the uh, format the, was yeah. going to be. But Nicole was you know pregnant at that time, and I, I wasn't going to go uh, and go play Survivor uh, during that time. Um, leaving her behind, pregnant. That could have been the dumbest survivor move of all time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Could have been. Could have been. Could have been. Um, 
but it was you know it was very early on in the like it was not like a like uh they were they were calling a lot of people so i don't want to make it seem like it was a lock but i think that once we would have like got in the casting uh you know uh like when you know i, I think we we had a shot yeah i think that 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 is a definitely a fun survivor to imagine um so really quickly because i feel like now people would want to know whose whose spot do you think you would have been competing for if it well, was I think it let's probably say it, would have been uh so it's tough because i think we probably would have been in competition with tyson and rachel uh because mm -hmm. it, it would have been a like a male survivor with a female loved one uh rupert i don't think i would have knocked out rupert if they would have had, happy to have him back uh, and other other like unless they like completely like then started changing things around um, like I'm trying to think of who else uh, would have fit that criteria like even to say like John and Candace like that wouldn't have worked because uh, Nicole wouldn't have been on the favorites tribe um, or the returning player tribe so. Um, I don't know if there is another uh, person yeah, that we could have bumped. I think Tyson Rachel makes a lot of sense because yeah. I think you and Tyson share kind of a, that wittiness as well. So you'd be competing mm -hmm. for a similar spot. Um, I will really just uh, end this here and mention that uh, in that Caramoan recap, um, there's also a moment where it says that Rob also laments that Brenda did not reach out to him for a fan favorite endorsement. Uh, as she only lost to Malcolm by 1%, the hashtag RHAP endorsement could have put her over the edge. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, look, I, I was a big uh, Brenda fan from Survivor Nicaragua. Uh, I, I was excited to see her come back and play again, although disappointed with ultimately what we got in Caramel. Well, you know, Rob, it's interesting. Just a few years later, RHAP became a must stop for everyone campaigning to come back for Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So it really, you know, this is like a starting point. And I think this is also when like RHP was really getting so many people uh, getting into it. So I, uh, yeah, I thought that was a fun, a fun uh, look back um, at kind of how Eric was even perceived a bit then kind of how people were talking about him even after Kara Moen. So yeah. Um, uh, Nigel, are we kind of ready to start kind of wrapping things up here and maybe well, can I just Go add ahead. one other thing? Uh, so of course we've talked about Eric in season 16. Uh, and then we talked about Eric when he comes back in season 26, but we haven't talked about yet the third act in the trilogy of ultimately when Eric's necklace and finally Eric return in season 36 in survivor ghost Island with uh, the chance to reverse the curse, ultimately, first, Eric's necklace ends up having some redemption on its own, where Wendell ends up uh, discovering the er Eric's cursed necklace, and he keeps it. It has now become, or it has uh, maintained its power as a full immunity idol, and it is something, ultimately, that Wendell does not need to use, but at the very same final five, the last night that it can be used as an or it's an it's an idol now, not a necklace. Um, this is still a necklace, not an immunity necklace. Um, but we see where Wendell takes off the immunity necklace slash idol and gives it away to a woman on his tribe. And ultimately, that same act that Eric did with the necklace some 20 seasons ago, ultimately turns out to be uh, a point in favor of Wendell when Laurel cast the tie-breaking vote. That that bond that they had, as demonstrated by uh, Wendell giving her the necklace, ultimately leads to Wendell winning the game. And we see both Eric and James at the reunion show for Survivor Ghost Island and Jeff even gives an apology to Eric Reichenbach and says, hey, you were making big moves back then. And so we owe you an apology so that you did not make a dumb move. And, and I don't know if he said that you're not the dumbest survivor ever, but he did uh, give some praise to Eric Reichenbach. A great point, great memory of of all of that. I mean, I think it's it's really cool that uh, there is a third act of Eric, right? Uh, and that it's uh, we get to see the necklace return. I mean, it is like a survivor artifact at at this point. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I think uh, as we were talking about the the micro experience earlier, you know, I, I think you could argue there was a little bit of a curse on that beach. 
stupid move after stupid move per the resources that you've <laughs> you know gathered for us here, Kevin. Uh, and all these years later, Wendell is able to uh, to lift the curse, a la a movie like The Mummy or something like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you know, can you argue that it was the dumbest move of all time if the artifact returns and is something that is used to help someone win the game? <laughs> Yeah. If if Jeff is going to apologize and retract this statement, I think we can definitively say that this is not the dumbest move in all. He's been exonerated. History. It's it's like a, an appeals court has ruled that this is not the dumbest move. But then they then where? But like I feel like all the promos still come up after it, right? Or is it just before it goes? Well, to they Ireland? still say it all the time. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't. He he he's been he's been pardoned to an extent, but maybe not for all charges. It's one of those situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, Jeff doesn't always have the best memory. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But at a time, he he exonerated Eric. Yeah. Um. And so, you know, I guess to kind of start wrapping things up here, uh, you know, I feel like an hour and a half of uh, has just flown by us. Um. Uh. Do we? I think we all agree that Eric is not the dumbest survivor of all time. Yeah. I, you know, I think that when we started this conversation, I. I would have said that there was certainly an argument for him being the dumbest, but I, I didn't believe it, but there was a lot there to uh, consider him to have that title. But yeah. talking through all of this and some other moves, I actually would be hard pressed to agree that it was the dumbest move of all time. Yeah. I mean, also like we didn't really talk about it too much, but he makes a pretty savvy move uh, to like uh, stay in the game and ultimately ingratiate himself to Ozzy and get Amy voted out of the game in the pre-merge when you're comparing him to some uh, other players where like, you know, the dumbest survivor player ever has zero good moves, you know, that uh, the dumbest survivor player is incapable of making like any sort of savvy moves and putting themselves in a position where they could win the game. And so I think that, you know, it was an int- it, the dumbest survivor ever is so bad at survivor that uh, they're, they're incapable of even just like shutting up and listening to somebody who knows what to do. Like maybe like, uh, you know, it's it's somewhere in between like a Zane Knight who is just like uh because Zane Knight could have been potentially good, like had some good ideas. Uh the dumbest survivor have ever has no good ideas. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Zane Knight would have been a fun one to consider for dumbest move of all time, too. Yeah, I mean it's like who who could possibly be that's why I said earlier. It's like I don't know who the dumbest is, though. I think maybe JT's move is truly the most harebrained and, and unnecessary, and that I think Jeff's choices in Game Changers are truly dumb. But um, uh, I, I think I think yeah, Eric's not even in the the bottom ten most dumbest survivors of all time. I want to say thank you to Eric for giving us an absolutely incredible moment of television and for being such a good sport because, you know, I I think it could have been a lot. Eric's not even the dumbest person in that season. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) You know, I I think that moment could have been a lot less fun if he was not a good sport about it and had, you know, really struggled with the scam that had been pulled on him. But he allowed it to be this, uh, you know, high point in a show that, we talk about, you know, entering the modern era at that time. Yeah. And it's like, I, 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 I in the way that I, I, I thank God that JT was so foolish in Heroes versus Villains, in the way that I thank Eric for also that, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. you, and, and I'm glad that like, it seems like that fans recognize that, you know, there's like a campy aspect. It's like, you don't have to read this so literally and be so like, it's like, he's just an idiot or something. It's like, actually like for our own benefit, this person was humiliated on national television. So like, let's give him some respect. You know, I think this is actually a very important lesson. Eric, you know, taught us that even the smartest of people can be scammed. So, you know, never think of yourself as above that. And always just be a little bit on alert when someone could be scamming you. Oh, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, Rob, do you have any final thoughts on Eric or, or hot takes to share? No, I think we've uh, talked through all of the hot takes. I think that Eric is a guy who I I definitely feel like that if Eric played in Survivor 46 and not in Survivor 16, that I think that the show itself would have presented everything that went into Eric a lot differently. I think that maybe he would be more of a uh, sympathetic figure than a 
laughing stock of uh, what happened to him. And so it's definitely like a, a different time when Survivor could present this story of, you know, the gullible guy who fell for the, the trick from the Femme Fatale Alliance. Like it was like an easier story to tell then. And I do think that we are much more sophisticated as an audience. I do think that Survivor probably would take like a little bit more care with trying to tell that story now. Yes, I, I agree. And I just think it's a really, it's a poetic moment. It feels like it really wraps the season in a bow. What a great penultimate episode to kind yeah. of get to. Um, and I think um, uh, we are just very lucky to have Eric uh, be there. And I think be the archetypal fool if you will even if he actually is not bad at survivor but someone had to kind of be the casualty of it all and they already embarrassed the other men on that season so it was eric's turn <laughs> up to bat mm -hmm. so sure. folks there you have it the story of eric reichenbach rob thank you for uh joining us today now you're a busy man what do you have coming up that you'd like to share Oh, uh, we have kicked off our Survivor 44 interview series. And so uh, at this time, uh, certainly my interview with Jam Jam has been posted and be on the lookout for uh, more to come here. And also, uh, as we are in the Survivor offseason, be sure to check out another podcast that we have going on this summer as Kellen Bechtold has been doing a series, speaking of Survivor Ghost Island, has been doing a series called Road to Reality, where she is uh, talking with survivors, doing a deep dive into their lives outside of Survivor. And so she's done some really fun Survivor interviews this summer, and that's all up at robiswebsite.com. Thanks, Rob. Kevin, what can you tell people about uh, our next episode? So our next episode is, uh, is JT Overrated? Uh, which maybe this will give us some fodder to work with from this uh, episode. We'll be doing is JT overrated with the frail Mary. So oh, uh, that will be coming out next, and then we'll have our the Beth Dixon uh, episode about Ozzy, uh, which is is Ozzy one of the best to never win uh, in the following weeks as well. So we have some some great great episodes. Wonderful, and of course, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me at Asian Narc on Twitter, which is short for my Instagram handle at Asian Narcissist. And you can find me on Twitter at Nigel Speed. Rob, where do you want people to find RHAP content? Uh, you can subscribe to everything we're doing over at robhasawebsite.com slash subscribe. All right. Well, thank you again to the both of you for uh, having this fantastic discussion today. We hope you enjoyed listening and uh, see you next time.